Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our living room lecture series, and thank you for joining us tonight. We have a coastal air time migration hypothesis by Dr. Jim Cassidy. My name is Vanessa Chapin, and I am the public archaeology coordinator at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Just a few announcements. Sorry, <laughs> just a few announcements before we get started. This Saturday, April 8th, in the center classroom, join us for our second Saturday lecture screening where we will share some of our favorite past living room lecture presentations. This week for the topic, we will be screening Baja California Prehistory and Animal Bones and Teeth, Stone Age Environment Revealed. Also, make sure to save the date January, or sorry, save the date Saturday, April 29th for our annual barbecue event. Please join us for an afternoon of food, fun, and music in support of the center. Details on this and other information about the center, our curation efforts, and programs can be found online at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Tonight, we'll be using the Q&A feature. You can find it on your Zoom control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation during the moderated Q&A. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Jim Cassidy. He has conducted field research on the California Channel Islands, the maritime region of the Russian Far East and Baja California. He is a co-author of the book, California Maritime Prehistory, and co-edited a book on the maritime prehistory of Northeast Asia. Dr. Cassidy will discuss the Channel Islands maritime migration hypothesis. He will bring in key components of his research that includes seafaring route access and talks of expansion. Without further ado, Dr. Jim Cassidy. Well, thank you, Vanessa. Uh... I really appreciate having been invited to talk with you tonight. I've been a supporter of the San Diego Archaeological Center for many years. You, do, you guys do great work. Uh, over the years, the coastal maritime migration hypothesis has been a, uh, something of a fascination to me. And so, as you can see, uh, the bulk of my research has been related to Mar the formation of maritime societies across the North Pacific Rim. Well, to, to kind of orient the beginning of our talk, for the last hundred years, of course, most of us know that uh, the theory of the peopling of the New World is based upon the finding of Bulbous people, ultimately radiocarbon dated to around 13,000 years ago, that were thought to have traversed uh, Beringia from the uh, uh, Northeast Asia, uh, following into Alaska and down a nice free corridor uh, between the Cordillian uh, ice sheet and the Laurentide ice sheet uh, in order to get into the Central North America continent by at least 13,000 years ago. Uh, this was the predominant peopling theory for the New World until about 1979 when Newt Fladmark suggested that it might have been easier for people to traverse along the coast rather than down this uh, hypothetical ice-free corridor following along refugia using rudimentary kinds of watercraft such as rafts in order to traverse obstacles along the way such as uh, headwaters, glaciers, rivers, things of that nature. Uh, at that time, though, in 1979, his ideas were not taken particularly seriously and were uh, pretty much shelved for the last 30 years. Well, that kind of changed over the last decade, say, as geologic research began to realize that that ice fabled ice-free corridor that would have had to have been traversed into the New World probably didn't actually open up between the two glaciers until about 11 or 12,000 years ago, which is, of course, is far too late for, for a, to have been the corridor to access uh, the New, New North America uh, by the Clovis people. So Newt Fladmark's ideas began to take a more robust uh, form. Part of that was coincidental with a lot of the research that had been 
uh, being conducted on the Northern Channel Islands by John Erlinson, Todd Flager, uh, Tom, excuse me, Todd Bradgia, and uh, colleagues uh, on the on the island of Santa Rosé, which currently forms the four Northern Channel Islands, but during the late Pleistocene, with sea levels lower than uh, 400 feet lower than present, uh, was a single uh, late Pleistocene island. Through the research that John Erlinson had been doing on the islands, along with John Johnson on Santa Rosa Island, it became realized that these this uh, Pleistocene island had been occupied at least 13,000 years ago. Well, at that time, that was coincidental with the period of occupation by the Clovis people, uh, which uh, uh, projectile points related to the Clovis people have been found along Tulare Lake in the San Joaquin Valley, later known as the Western Approval Lakes tradition, and where they also met with the Western Stem Point tradition. Uh, this, is, this is located about 115 kilometers north of Santa Barbara coast um, and where the channel to get to Santa Rosa at that time was only about five to eight kilometers or approximately five miles. But the research being conducted by John Erlinson and colleagues hypo hypothesized that the occupation of the island may well have taken place by a paleo-coastal people seafaring down along the coast of North America and peopling those islands. Quite a bit of ink has been uh, spread around relating to those concepts starting back around 1997, continuing through 2020 and uh, 2010, as you can see some examples here, culminating in an article that was published by American Antiquity in 2020, about three years ago, by Todd Bradger, John Erlinson, and colleagues. Uh, as you can see, this article was titled Flatmark Plus 40 Years. What have we learned about the potential Pacific Coast peopling of, of the Americas? And this was a very influential article that basically argued that most American archaeologies now subscribe to a paleo-coastal migration along the coast. But a number of very interesting points were made in that article that I thought were quite provocative. First is that seafaring societies colonized Australia and the Ryuka Islands of Japan between 70 and 30,000 years ago. Well, this was astonishing 20 or 30 years ago, but, but this is something that John Erlinson well-established in American archaeology uh, some time ago. But of course, we're talking about tropical and subtropical waters spreading northward uh, over a period of about 40,000 years. A second point they brought up is that primarily evidence of seafaring is based upon the colonization, colonization of nearshore islands. Generally, we're talking about 25 miles or less, uh, which would be accessible by rudimentary watercrafts such as rafts. So how do we define what is just near coastal voyaging by rudimentary watercraft as opposed to traveling down the coast from the North Pacific all the way to the Santa Rosa Island? A third point brought up was defining of what maritime people are. And basically in archeology, span it's people who eat marine resources. Well, that's about as specific as we get, although that's a very circular argument and has been the basis of the kelp highway hypothesis that argued that people could subsist on uh, the resources found among kelp, uh, as they traveled across Beringia and down the North Pacific, uh, Western coast of North America to subsist upon. But this hypothesis has never really found a direct association with human use or occupation. 
A fourth point that was made in that article was that uh, mariners traveled down along the west coast of, the, of North America utilizing sophisticated watercraft. Well, that's great, except that they don't define what they mean by sophisticated watercraft. In fact, when pressed on this subject, generally the answer is, well, we can't really know what the watercraft looked like because they didn't survive through from the late Pleistocene. So that's not particularly helpful in us defining uh, this maritime migration hypothesis. And finally, the point they brought up was that we really don't have definitive answers about when and how first Americans arrived in the new world. Therefore, what we're, what we're talking about is theoretical or hypothetical propositions relating to what might have been possible uh, if, in fact, this took place and sophisticated watercraft and seafaring people actually existed in the late Pleistocene to migrate into the New World. Now, all of this sort of is summarized in a very interesting paragraph included in the article that I thought was really packed with very uh, research provoking ideas. And if I may quote it, ancestors of the Ainu used boats to reach obsidian outcross on Kozushima Island, roughly about 40 to uh, 30 kilometers uh, from shore that placed seafaring people in the late Pleistocene maximum suggesting that they were developing boats and other technological capabilities to continue around the Pacific Rim and Beringia and beyond some 36,000 years ago. Uh, this is based upon research done by IKEA uh, in Japan. Well, there's a number of issues that this brings up that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, number one, the uh, Kosashima Island is off the island of Honshu. Uh, off just south of the Bay of Tokyo, uh, whereas the Ainu occupy Hokkaido Island to the north. And these are two separate and distinct populations. Uh, also, genetic research now tells us that the Ainu were not direct uh, ancestors of Native Americans, but in fact were probably cousins uh, originating from the southern Amur River area where ancient Eurasians and ancient East Asian populations came together at, to genetically evolve to Native American populations that we now find in the New World. So they're not directly related, related although they are indirectly related. Uh, it says that seafarers are, uh, in this instance, are found in the cooler waters of Japan, but in fact, uh, Kuzushima Island on the island of Honshu is the northern reach of the Kurashio uh, water currents, which are tropical or rather subtropical waters that push northward along the Ryukyu Islands in Japan. And so we're not talking about cooler waters, we're talking about subtropical waters where they then meet with uh, subarctic waters of the Yoshio uh, current coming southward. Uh, this was also not during the last glacial maximum, since we're talking about a period between 30 and 40,000 years ago, uh, when sea levels, in fact, were higher than the last glacial maximum. Uh, finally, the idea that they were doing all of this to continue around the North Pacific Rim, Beringia, and beyond suggests that they actually knew that these places existed when, in fact, they did not. So all of these questions stimulated me to think about the work that I've done in the Russian Far East. I have worked in that area for about 25 to 30 years since perestroika, developed many colleagues uh, in Northeast Asia, and with uh, the help of Irina Pankratova and Ben Fitzhugh, we pulled together an edited volume by many of the scholars of Northeast Asia to address the maritime migration hypotheses. Uh, this has not been done, and most of this literature has not been available in English prior to that. This uh, volume was published in 2022 in August, 
and is available online through Amazon or other booksellers. So if it's a subject you're interested in that would expand upon this talk tonight, I would recommend that you take a look at that. But basically, when you're talking about migrations coming out of East Asia or even Southeast Asia, the focus today in research centers around crossing into, into the waters around Taiwan and then traveling up the Ryukyu Islands, as you see here, and then reaching Kyushu uh, and Shukuku Islands, which are all bonded together with Honshu due to lowered sea levels at that time. And also sea voyages taking place from Korea across the Korean Strait to uh, populate the uh, Paleo Honshu Island. So we're talking about populations of East Asians coming from perhaps Taiwan and Korea, creating populations that essentially evolved into the Jamon during the early Holocene, late Pleistocene, early Holocene trans transition. But this does not include Hokkaido. In conjunction with putting together that edited volume, I also was thinking quite a bit about all the research that has been done on uh, the Northern Channel Islands or Santa Rosé Island in the late Pleistocene and how this can be brought together and converged in order to better inform what we currently know uh, about the uh, maritime migration into the new world. And I think we know more than we think we know, or at least have thought so up to this date. And based on that, I tried to apply universal technological assessments of what, what applies to the use and, and formation of seaworthy watercraft by sea, uh, seafaring people. Uh, people have often asked what, what these craft might have looked like. The general answer has been, we can't know because they're all gone. But I disagree with that. I think technological universals can tell us quite a bit. Looking along the coast of North America, as people, if you talk about a coastal migration, what dates do we have to support that? Well, as you can see, all of the dates here pretty much fall into the early Holocene or very late Pleistocene, such as Kilgawea at 13,000 years ago, Oops, excuse me, and newly discovered Triquet Island, which is very close to the coast, only a few kilometers off, uh, the dates to 14,000 years. Cedros Island was actually part of the peninsula, not an island at the time, as was Espiritu, Espiritu Santo Island. So the most research in the area which we have the most knowledge comes from Santa Rosé. <coughs> Excuse me. Focus, focusing in closer to the Southern California Bight, we also see that there aren't any other analogies that date to 13,000 years, except for Santa Rosé. Along the Northern coast, uh, we have a couple sites that are around 10,000 and none of the islands in the Southern Channel Island area were occupied until the later part of the early Holocene. Again, as I pointed out earlier, the only population we have that was comparable to the dates that occupied Santa Rosé are up in Tulare Lake that also date to about 13,000 years ago and is only about 115 kilometers march to the coast and a uh, five mile raft trip over to the island. So I'd like to say all of the uh, ideas coming forth uh, from this article were mine, but in fact, what got me really thinking was Mark Sutton's uh, article in Paleo Indian, uh, Paleo America in 2018, in which basically he said that if the Northern Channel Islands were colonized by seafaring people, then we would expect the Southern Channel Islands to have been occupied shortly thereafter. Well, that's, that's a pretty succinct and direct projection of, of uh, how we might be able to test whether sophisticated maritime people using uh, seaworthy watercraft actually 
were capable of coming down the coast and peopling the Channel Islands. So working further along with that idea, I, was, I began to look at the current research as it stands today. Now, when the 13,000 year date was established for Santa Rosé, uh, that was among the oldest dates for North America. And it made sense to begin to hypothesize possibly another route of entry along the coast. But since that time, we found a number of sites that have been discovered below Clovis uh, layers, such as at the Galt Friedkin site you see here, that yielded earlier occupations dating around 16,000 years ago that had a uh, projectile or stemmed projectile point horizon. And it was quite different, of course, from Clovid. Uh, this date is comparable to the one found by Laura Davis at Cooper's Ferry. We know about Paisley Caves and some other sites. So now we're talking about the peopling of the new world 4,000 years earlier than the Clovis period as a peopling event. So how do we talk about the Channel Islands and the, and the Northern and Southern Channel Islands and when they were populated originally? Well, Troy Davis and John Erlinson and colleagues published an article in 2010 that talks about crescents that you see here, which are transverse points thought to be used to as uh, dark points to knock birds out of the air, were found, in fact, on the Southern Channel Islands of San Nicolas and Catalina, Santa Catalina. Unfortunately, none of those points have been provenienced or dated. The only other dated site we have uh, in the Southern Channel Islands, the early, earliest date we have is an average of a, a number of dates found and, and yielded from the lowest level in the Eel Point site on San Clemente Island, which uh, I and Mark Robb have published on in a number of prior uh, publications. So we know that people were occupying the islands somewhere, Southern Islands, somewhere between 12 and 8,000 years ago, but probably closer to 8,500 years ago uh, or, or more recent, as I'll show you in a minute. How did they get there? Well, one of the modes, as I suggested earlier, to get to Santa Rosé across that rather narrow channel was simply by using rafts, which is, gains its buoyancy simply from the materials that you use to tie together for the raft in order to penetrate up between the uh, members, uh, which is usually a fairly flat bottom. And you basically raft your way across following the wind currents and the ocean currents to get to the uh, destination you want to reach. Now, using experimental archaeology, Robert Bederick and Sean Bednarik, excuse me, and Sean McGraw have established that rafts can only travel about one to two knots maximum, and which means that in a day's time, can only travel as far as about 45 kilometers or 25, 28 miles. So to reach from the Northern Channel Islands to the Southern Channel Islands, uh, they simply don't have the capacity to do that. Uh, in a recent critique of my article in California Archaeology, was, uh, John Erlinson and Todd Bradger published uh, an argument which they criticized uh, my findings because they don't clearly don't agree with theirs and did not like the idea of me defining a Thule balsa uh, as being a uh, sophisticated ocean growing watercraft, but in fact was probably more like an enhanced raft because even though they were covered on the bottom with asphaltum, ultimately the water would creep into and between the bundles, the bundles would become waterlogged 
and, and begin to sink and drag, and they would not be able to reach great distances greater than about 25 miles as a raft does. So what is a seaworthy watercraft? Um, probably the closest analogy we have are 9,000 year old canoes that have been found in both Japan and Korea that were used to traverse between the two uh, during the early Holocene about 9,000 years ago. And if you'll look at this particular canoe, it's quite interesting. It's, this is a 9,000 year old canoe, but along the edges, you notice that it has, excuse me, along the edges, it has been carved with inserts that it would allow the, ins the mounting of gunnels uh, on the sides to keep waves from swamping the canoe as it traveled over open water. Now these seagoing watercraft would be based upon ethnographic analogy by Kenneth Ames in the Northwest Coast and Sean McGrail uh, would be able to travel between four and five uh, knots or about five miles per hour and thus could travel as far as 55 miles or 90 kilometers in a day. And this would be possible uh, in order to reach more distant islands. So what are the technological universes, universal features that I'm talking about that would have to apply to both late Pleistocene and early Holocene or even today's watercraft? Well, first, they don't use the buoyancy of the material itself to float on the water, thus allowing water to penetrate in between the members. They actually are waterproof and, and displace the water as they settle down in the water. And this prevents water from penetrating into the boat and exposing the uh, passengers of the boat to hypothermic temperatures over long periods of time. So that the people are more insulated. The bow and the stern are shaped so that they can provide more directional uh, momentum and fight water currents and wind currents as they tra travel to a uh, designated destination. The shape over time was gradually more and more V-shaped in its hull allowing it to settle deeper in the water and also providing a prominent keel that runs along the bottom that gives its directionality and greater weight. The, the vessel itself could be weighted down and stabilized and is by the application of ballast, either as stone uh, or by adding cargo and passengers to allow the vessel to sink deeper in the water and prevent capsizing and allow for greater directional movement. The gunnels built up along the sides also prevent ocean, open ocean waves from coming over and swamping the boat. And generally, you can pick out larger trees to provide the foundation for these watercraft in, in greater size, allowing for greater passengers and cargo capacities. So whether it's in the late Pleistocene or Hervis early Holocene or now, these are technological universals that we know had to exist for people uh, to come across in a maritime migration. Well, let's apply these principles to the Northern and Southern Channel Island. And what we find is the, the Southern Channel Island of San Nicolas is about 77 kilometers from Santa Cruz, therefore beyond the reach of a raft. From San Nicolas to Santa Catalina and San Clemente, almost the same distance. So what happened at around the early Holocene that allowed people to all of a sudden be able to access these islands? Well, the first thing that I hypothesize is that uh, sea levels during the end of the late Pleistocene transition and the early Holocene rose to about 30 to 40 
uh, meters of present sea levels. And that in its process separated Santa Rosé into the four channel islands that we know today. Well, this would have caused major disruption to the people that were already settled on Santa Rosé. So what did they do in order to maintain connection with these separate areas? And that would be the stimulus in my mind to begin to innovate with the use of watercraft, moving them way away from rafts to more seaworthy vehicles. <coughs> Excuse me. In order to maintain connection with, with these populations as these waters gradually rose and separated the islands. Well, this would in turn, I think, stimulate an expansion to the Southern Channel Islands because uh, San Nicolas would be visible on the horizon. And as is universally known with humans everywhere, if there's an empty space, they wanna go take a look at it and occupy it, which did take place. But it, they did not take place 13,000 years ago or 12,000 years ago. It, it appears to have taken place probably somewhere between eight and 9,000 years ago. This inundation uh, resulted in the abandonment of existing uh, ecological niches as the water raised and forced people to explore and experiment with, with new uh, habitats, optimal foraging habitats. And as a result, with the innovation of seafaring watercraft, the util or exploitation of a broadening of diet breath and uh, new prey species. Now we know that prior to 8,500 years ago, large pelagic species that did not haul up onto the land such as seals and so, uh, were not found in the archeological record. But after 85,000 years ago, when seaworthy watercraft evidently were developed, we begin to find other species such as dolphin, sunfish, tuna, and swordfish in the archeological record. So what conclusions do we draw from all of this? Um, first, I would argue that Newt Fladmark's idea of traveling along the coast using expedient forms of watercraft to circumvent obstacles along the way at the present time appears to be the most reasonable scenario and uh, probably would account for even Triquet Island, which has recently been discovered. Secondly, there is no empirical evidence to support an idea of seafaring societies employing sophisticated watercrafts to enter the new world during the late Pleistocene to support those hypotheses. Third, Santa Rosé was not occupied until at least 3,000 years after Paleoindians first migrated into the interior of North America. And so a coastal migration hypothesis does not represent an initial peopling event of the new world. Fourth, the Southern Channel Islands were not occupied until the early Holocene when the four Northern Channel Islands were already separated through sea levels as I've already discussed. And finally, these events most likely caused the local innovation of indigenous people, uh, the, the Proto-Chumash and maybe Tongva, Proto-Tongva, uh, to create seaworthy watercraft and expand their diet breaths to include large pelagic marine species. So finally, at history, historic contact, we find that the Chumash and the Tongva are traveling among all of the Northern and Southern Channel Islands, utilizing very sophisticated, technologically complex blank canoes that probably evolved over the entire early and middle and late Holocene, culminating into the watercraft that we find at historic contact. And the local indigenous populations are the ones who should receive 
credit for these magnificent developments rather than looking northward for migrants coming down the coast. So I thank you all for your time and listening to my presentation and would be happy to take questions if we have them. Dante. Thank you so much, Jim. My name is Dante Franga and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion as usual. And just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, I think we have a few questions already. What sparked your interest in pursuing this research topic? Well, as pointed out uh, in the forum article by American Antiquity, Newt Fladmark uh, had a very novel idea. Uh, I grew up sailing uh, along the coast and along the Channel Islands in my youth, uh, always had a fascination with watercraft, and this really sparked my interest. Uh, the Ice Free Corridor has been controversial probably since its inception, since even if it opened up prior to the Clovis people, would have been a very rugged and difficult terrain to follow. And it would take probably at least a thousand to 2000 years to uh, create a soil that would support biotic uh, plants and animals that could traverse down the ice free corridor. So this seemed like a, a pretty inelegant way to enter the world and challenging, if you, you might say. And so that's been a controversy that of course has been going on for 40 years as well. Uh, so my, my fascination and love of watercraft probably was the foundation for my exploring this as a, as a field. All right, we had a couple comments saying that this was a terrific presentation and thank you so much for presenting. We thank you. We also have another question. Did any of your findings surprise you? Well, the truth is, and in my early work, such as the article I wrote uh, in 2004 on Eel Point in San Clemente, I was arguing indirectly for a maritime migration uh, in support of that. Uh, this was the earliest Southern Channel Island uh, site dated ra radiocarbon-wise and uh, was a fascinating thing at the time. And keep bearing in mind that these now known 16,000 years old dates didn't exist. We thought Clovis was the earliest date. So we thought we were closing in on a maritime migration idea. Uh, in order to pursue that, when Perestroika came along in 1995, uh, I had already, obviously we'd all grown up in the Cold War with Russia as our enemies. And I was uh, taking some classes at University of Riverside with Phil Wilkie, who happened to have a couple of Russians who had come over on grants after Perestroika to learn American lithic technology. Uh, we, we became friends. I showed them around North American or California archeological sites. <coughs> and in turn, they told me, hey, we're doing excavations on the Northern Sea of Japan that date to at least 13,000 years ago. How would you like to come and work with us? So that's how I got started in studying the Russian Far East, Northern, uh, excuse me, Northern Sea of Japan area. And through that, over the last 25 or 30 years, have developed a, a number of close colleagues and, and research in that area that was basically designed to look at the whole peopling process. So this is ultimately a culmination of my work in, in both worlds kind of coming together over time. That's a long answer for a short question. And then we have a question. Wouldn't people dip into the coastal, oh, sorry, my question scrolled off one moment. Wouldn't people dip into the coastal areas the long periods during and after their trips to the Channel Islands. I'm sorry, uh, read that again. I didn't sure. quite follow. We wanted to know whether people would then go to the coastal areas for long periods during and after their trips to the Channel Islands. 
Well, you might think so, but we don't really have evidence of that. Uh, as I pointed out, 13,000 years ago, we have evidence of people occupying Tulare Lake. Uh, but along the coast, we don't find people occupying there until around 10,000 years ago. Uh, I think the earliest coastal date, which I find very intriguing, uh, dates to around 9,000 years ago at Malaga Cove on Palos Verdes Peninsula, which is very near Catalina. And we know as they occupied that site, there's a lot of shell beads and steatite, which demonstrate a connection, but that's 9,000 years ago. There's also 10,000 year old sites along the coast, but nothing that goes into the uh, <coughs> late Pleistocene or Pleistocene transition. So that's an intriguing question. You would think so, but we don't have evidence of it at this point. And we had a couple questions about where this timber was coming from that would be available for making the canoes. What would be the source of a wood? When would it, was it available? Um, where would they get it? Well, that's a fascinating topic because it's it's been studied uh, fairly extensively uh, among the Chumash uh, on the Channel Islands, especially the Northern Channel Islands, but also on the Southern Channel Islands. Uh, cedar and redwood trees from Northern California after storms would be washed into the ocean. And these would float down the coast along the, uh, the uh, current that can, comes southward there, the California current, and end up being stranded in the eddies and onto the islands of uh, the Northern Channel Islands. Well, these are very, they're soft and they're straight grained and do not have knots in, in the wood, which makes it an ideal wood to work with uh, things like stone tools, because it, you could easily make wedges, which we find at Eel Point on San Clemente Island, <coughs> to separate these planks and build, use them to build into uh, other features such as boxes that, are, that have been found on San Nicolas Island, but uh, also we find it, that were used in the plank canoes of the Chumash and Tongva at historic contact. So it's primarily thought that it sees redwood and cedar driftwoods that came down the coast. But of course, dugout canoes could also be made from trees found, say, along the Santa Barbara coast and were at historic contact. Why do we assume that travel times via water were limited to daylight hours? Um, couldn't there have been some moonlit transits? Actually, we don't assume that it was done in daylight hours. You are correct that with tidal flows and uh, moon activity, the best time to travel is probably three or four in the morning. And if you get out on the water at three and four in the morning, if you ever travel on the ocean or among those Channel Islands, you'll see that the water is absolutely like glass in many instances. And those would be the ideal times to launch your boats, uh, say around midnight or so, and travel to the islands and get there early, relatively early morning. And if the four of the islands were joined until the water level rose, wouldn't the local people have been more likely to travel to what are now separate islands? Well, the one island of Santa Rosa was much larger than the four channel islands that exist today. And they did travel the entire length of it. Uh, the islands, the areas that we find uh, the 13,000 year dates are actually the uh, westernmost islands furthest from the coast. Uh, but to get to San Nicolas, which was never closer than it is, even with lowered sea levels, because that's a seamount island. Uh, it was always 75 to 80 kilometers away. So unless you have a sophisticated watercraft that can travel four to five miles per hour, uh, they certainly couldn't get there. If they had sophisticated watercraft, yes, I agree. They should have been on San Nicolas. They should have been on San Clemente and Santa Catalina, but they weren't as far as, far as we know at the present time. And what about Monte Verde? 
which had the much earlier date of, I want to say about 14,000 here. 14,700, yeah. Well, Monteverde Verde is, is near the coast, but it's 30 kilometers inland. It's not a coastal site. Uh, Huachaparito is actually a closer uh, coastal site in Peru, uh, and that dates also to about 15,000 years ago. But again, if we can't establish a North Pacific maritime migration coming across Beringia and down the West Coast to occupy the Northern and Southern Channel Islands, then I'm not sure how we can argue that they continued on down to Peru in boats. Now we can argue that people were that were in the continental area of North America 16,000 years ago could have tra traversed along the land down to Peru by 15,000 years ago, and then occupied near coastal sites at that time. Do the early Spanish records, especially those from the tip of Baja, California, provide any data on watercraft? Oh, as a matter of fact, they do. Uh, Oyoya, who sailed up the Sea of Cortez in 15, uh, 40, I believe it was, uh, traveled all along uh, the Sea of Cortez and the uh, eastern coast of Baja, California, and even came up along the western coast of Baja as far as, I think, a little south of uh, Cedros Island. Uh, and so they, they commented quite extensively on the craft that they used down there, uh, which but which were largely uh, dugout canoes and balsa canoes, but were not heavy seaworthy uh, seafaring watercraft as we find, say, compared to the plank canoes above the Chumash. Since the coastal areas are primarily sandstone, could sites earlier than 10,000 years ago be found offshore, maybe along the sea bottom? Well, I believe research into that is being done. Uh, I think Todd Bradgett got a major uh, research grant by the National Park Service to look at underwater archaeology, where they're mapping likely. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, likely settlement areas to see whether sediment cores or underwater archaeology can be conducted to establish that. Uh, uh, we, we in uh, Queen Charlotte Island in the north, the 13,000 year old sites found there were actually underwater uh, by a few feet uh, that were occupied at 13,000 years ago, but subsequently sea level rise covered them up. So we know that there are underwater sites and a considerable amount of, of research is being done to better inform us about those early sites, but that remains uh, research for the future and younger men than I. So for students who are interested in pursuing maritime studies or pursuing um, what, you know, something like this coastal maritime migration hypothesis, what colleges have programs where this research is being done? Well, uh, I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, John Erlinson and Torben Rick and a number of other prominent researchers on the Channel Islands uh, came out of there and got their degrees from there. So that's certainly uh, an excellent school to look at. University of Hawaii in terms of Polynesians uh, voyaging canoes uh, has been very active in this subject for many, many years. And uh, you know, I would highly recommend them. Uh, one of my colleagues who co-authored or co-edited the book uh, on Northeast Asia with me, uh, uh, Ben Fitzhugh at the University of Washington does a lot of work in both Alaska and in Northeast Asia. So the University of Washington, I think is an excellent uh, possibility there. So there are, a number of very good schools around 
if and if you start with that and dig into it, um, I think you'll come up with some pretty good ideas of where you might want to look. All right, and just as a reminder, we have time for a few more questions. So if anybody still has a burning question, please make sure to drop it in the Q&A. What is next for your research? Well, I'm currently uh, rewriting the book on maritime California maritime archaeology that was published in 2009. Unfortunately, my colleague Mark Robb has passed away, so I can't directly collaborate with him to do a second edition. But I think there's a lot of research that has come about since 2009 that is worth being made to the public. <coughs> so at the present time, I've been doing quite a bit of research on uh, especially the Southern Channel Islands, which is not as widely known as the Northern Channel Islands uh, on San Nicolas, San Clemente, Santa Barbara, and Catalina. And I hope perhaps in the next two years to uh, pull together a complimentary volume that brings that data up to date. Well, thank you, Jim. And we look forward to that volume. Thank you to everyone for attending tonight's Living Room Lecture. Don't forget for more information on our upcoming events, including our annual barbecue and the rest of our Living Room Lecture series, please visit our website, sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.